Views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the hosts and guests and not necessarily those of the staff or management of KLAV. Welcome to Aspects of Writing with your host, James Kelly. For the next 60 minutes, we'll explore every aspect of writing, including how to create, format, and even sell your work. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's seven three one one two three zero, or toll free one eight six six eight two zero K L A V. Now let's get right. Here's your host, James Kelly. Hello, and welcome to Aspects of Writing. I'm your host, James Kelly. On tonight's show, I have best-selling author J. A. Wilkins, and I have author lecturer Maxwell Alexander Drake and author Denny Griffin. Um, tonight's topic of the show is manuscript evaluation. We will discuss the importance of editing, how to get an editor, formatting your work, and programs that are available to help you with the formatting and writing process. Um, before I let my guests introduce themselves, I would like to share a few fun facts I got off the internet. A survey, survey by the New York Times showed that, from, from the survey, um, Charles Dickens was the oldest of the Dickens children, and as a result of his father's imprisonment for debt, he was sent to work in a shoe dye factory. After his father's release from prison, Dickens was able to return to school. However, his schooling was once again interrupted at age 15 when he became a clerk in a law firm. And let's see, we have another fun fact here. Did you know that American poet and short story writer uh, critique and... Uh, Sartarist, um, sorry, Dorothy Parker wrote her own epitaph, which reads, Excuse my dust. <laughs> All right, if you uh, are just tuning in, you are listening to Aspects of Writing with James Kelly right here on KLAV in Las Vegas. Uh, next, I would like to introduce my guests and let them tell you a little bit about themselves. Uh, my first guest is Joe Wilkins, and like I said, she is a well known author. Um, Joe, would you like to tell a little bit about yourself? Well, um, I. Uh started writing in 1991 with a co-author and we've written three books of a five book series it's science fiction science fact science fiction and um i love writing it's it's very fulfilling and you're also um the head of uh, oh, yes. writers group in the las vegas area yes i'm i'm the president of the henderson writers group we have almost 100 members, and we have the Las Vegas Writers Conference every year in April. Yeah, yeah, so you're getting ready to have the conference. Yeah. And in addition to that, you also have your own publishing company. I do. I, I started out as a helping people self-publish, and just this year I've started a new publishing house, an imprint called Ink and Quill, which is a traditional publishing house. We already have three authors signed. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> so, Denny, would you like to talk a little bit about yourself? Sure. I, my uh, background was in investigations in law enforcement in New York State. I started writing in 1996 after retirement. And my first uh, seven books were fiction mystery thrillers. And then I converted to nonfiction, and I currently have four nonfiction uh, police history and organized crime books on the market. I also um, am co host of the blog talk radio show Crime Wire and another show called Real Wise Guys. Oh, great. Okay, and Maxwell, are you on the line? I believe he's uh, going to be a guest in our show tonight. Yes, I am uh -huh. here. All right. Uh, our third guest is Maxwell Alexander Drake. And, Drake, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, I am uh, Maxwell Alexander Drake. I'm a sci-fi fantasy author for the most part. Um, I am the author of the award-winning Genesis of Oblivion saga. I also do comic books and graphic novels. Um, I'm working on a comedy musical that's supposed to open up here in uh, Las Vegas in August and um, several other projects. I also teach creative writing all over the country at large events and small um, and have a creative writing book coming out this year. So actually writing is your life. Yes, I am a full-time writer. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask three questions of each one of you, and I'm going to start with Joe. Uh, Joe, what, what enticed you to become an author? Well, I'm a very shy person. Okay. And my between I went back to school to get my teaching credentials, and between my English teacher and my husband, they decided that I should be an author. <laughs> my English teacher told me, "I've kept everything that you've you've written to use as examples to the other students in my future classes, and uh, so you need to really turn this into something that you can do." And when I gave her the first book, 
as a comp- as a thank you, she cried. <laughs> oh, that's, that's neat. Uh, so what is the best writing advice you've ever received? <sighs> to open my mind mm-hmm. and to let everything that I'm thinking come down and not to be stilted, not to keep anything back. Because you can always edit out what doesn't fit after you, after you've, you know, written a piece. Exactly. So, what what's a good piece of advice you could give an up and coming writer or an author? Learn the craft, be teachable, and don't ever think you're the best writer in the world because there's always going to be some flaws, no matter how hard you try. Right. And that's why you need an editor. That that is so important. And Denny, what about you? What enticed you to be an author? I had a story I wanted to tell. And um, I decided I would try my hand at writing a book. So I did. I never intended to write anything after that, but uh, people kind of liked the story. It was based, uh, in fact, on a true story, but people just thought I had a vivid imagination. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Was this why you were in law enforcement? Yes. Okay. So that that got me going, got me got me hooked. Okay. And what what is probably the best advice you've ever received? Don't quit. Ah, that's great. Okay, and what is a key piece of advice you might give to an upcoming writer? I'd like to expand a little bit on what Joe said. Learn the craft, and also, if you're going to stay in the business of writing, learn the business of writing. There's mm-hmm. a manuscript and any actual writing, but there's a lot more to it. I didn't do that when I started. I just got down at the keyboard and started typing. Uh, then I realized that there's certain types of publishers. There's self-publishing. There's traditional publishers. There's editors. There's scam artists out there. I, lots of scam artists. Lots mm-hmm. of, so uh, I, I would encourage anyone to you know work on your manuscript but learn about the business of writing as well. Thank you. And Drake, what about you? What enticed you to be an author? Well, I've actually been writing pretty much my whole life. I, I wrote my first full novel when I was 12. Um, the first book that I got published was actually the ninth full novel that I have written. And so I've just always written. It's always been an outlet for me to uh, express my imagination. Um, And people have always been enticed with the stories that I tell. So you were born with it? (laughs) I don't know about born with it, but I definitely started early. (laughs) Okay. And what is uh, the best piece of writing advice you've ever received? I would say the best piece of writing advice that I ever received was to edit out loud. Uh, Most people try to edit in their head. And especially with dialogue, if you edit in your head, you really never hear how it sounds because, you know, it's, it's in your head. So that is something that I follow to this day. And, you know, that's interesting because just today alone I was going over something and I was reading it out loud. So, uh, you yeah, know, that does make sense to me as well. Uh, what is a key piece of advice you would give to an up-and-coming writer or an author? Well, definitely everything the other two said. Uh, I say if I have to add something, uh, I've got mad writing rules that I have written, uh, and my first mad writing rule is write every day because once you get out of the habit of writing, if you take a week off or a month off, it's really hard to get back in the swing of things. Mm -hmm. So even if it's just one line, and I don't mean emails or blogs or anything like that. I mean your manuscript or your creative project, whatever you're working on, write at least one line a day. Even when I'm traveling, I will try and write one line a day. Okay. Uh, well, just out of curiosity, if you're working on a piece, Drake, do you stay with that one piece, or do you advise people maybe have several pieces and go back and forth if you have to? You know, that's going to be based on the author and, and what their abilities are and what their mindset is. I mean, some people like to focus on one thing. I have 10 paid projects that I'm working on right now, mm-hmm. um, and all of them have deadlines, and all of them have publishers screaming at me to get things done. So I... I like a lot of work. I like uh, I like to bounce around between projects because when I get dried up on one or, or stuck on something, instead of sitting there and him haunt about it, I do like to just just shift, just yeah. move to a different world, a different time, a different. I mean, that you know that's the nice thing about writing sci-fi fantasy. I'm writing, uh, you know, an undead western. I'm writing a post-apocalyptic war thing. I'm writing a completely fan- fantasy thing, a science fiction thing. So it allows me to to really become creative and go in any direction I want to go. I think that's so important, too. For me, as a writer, I do the same thing. I have many projects I'm always working on. Um, I actually used to paint. I I don't reveal that to too many people, but I used to paint as well. And and I I was horrible in school when when it came to that, especially in class and I had to turn in something. I would be working on something, and I'd get tired of it, and I'd move on to something else. And my art instructor used to say, when are you ever going to finish that? <laughs> so, But, you know, yeah. I always went back to it eventually. But I'm one of those, I have to be inclined to do it at, at that time. And 
if I veer away from it, you know, I'll go move on to something else, and eventually I'll go back to it. So. Right. The only thing that changes with that is when somebody's actually paying oh, you yeah. to do it, you do got to kind of finish. <laughs> <laughs> right. That, that's a whole different story altogether. Yes. <laughs> go ahead, Joe. Um, when I, I teach uh, writing classes for the city of Henderson, mm-hmm. and when I go through with my classes, I tell them, don't ever throw anything away. Start a tidbits file. When you get to that point where you're – you feel like you've got writer's block, go back into that file and look at the right. things that you've put in there, and it, it has to stimulate your creative right. juices. Pull something out of that pile. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Denny, how would you feel like I, that? I've had a uh, similar experience, I think. I, I've written or started different projects and never went very far with them. And um, when I'm when I'm on a, a a project I'm really trying to go full tilt on and I get hung up, I sometimes go back in the old stuff, and I'll find a character in there that I had in something I never mm-hmm. finished. It would fit perfectly in what I'm working on. So I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a pack rat. I get all okay. that stuff stored. Well, He's we're going to start. Never throw anything uh, away. No, <laughs> I don't either. No, I, I, I do the same thing. I'm gonna, we're going to start talking about manuscript evaluation, and there's a few things. I'm, I love the Internet. I'm always getting my information from the Internet. Um, What is manuscript evaluation? Well, according to Donna L. Quisenberry with the National Writer Examiner at examiner.com, this is a quote from her. And we're going to pick her quotes apart so we can all talk about this. But the first part of her quote is, for the author who elects to self-publish, use print on demand, or has, which is POD, or has had little success in marketing their manuscript, an evaluation and critique might be just what the doctor ordered. How do you guys feel about that? Drake, Joe? I think every brand new author should have a content editor go over their their mm-hmm. manuscript because there are things that you think you've got right and it and it's totally out in left field or you leave something out or you change locations and don't let someone know that you know don't let the reader know that you've mm-hmm. changed locations those are things that you can't see for yourself because you've got that story in your head and you know all the things that are going on or you've started a character and you've introduced them later on in the story right. after you've already started writing it, and you've got to continue with that. Drake, I know that you and Joe work together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How Joe's do you feel about what she said? <laughs> Joe, Joe's actually one of my editors for my uh, fantasy know. series, and she's fantastic. Um, <laughs> and yes, that's, I mean, the thing about writing, and, and not even talking about self publishing or traditional publishing at this point, but the thing about writing is, you know, a writing is a very lonely business. You you sit in your dark little room in your dark little corner in your dark with your dark little computer in your dark little mind and you're writing, you know, what you think is awesome. And if you don't get out, if you don't let other people, you know, take a look at it or, you know, if you can't afford to go with professional editors, um, you would be amazed. I mean, I believe that every writer be their own best fan. When I write something, it is fantastic. It's the best thing I've ever written. I am, <laughs> I am gushing at how awesome I am. Uh, why did I know I, you were going to say that? <laughs> and, then I, and then I send it to my editors, and it comes back, and it's just blood red. And I'm like, it's not that good. It wasn't that good. You know so, everyone does that. It really. Well, and that's, <laughs> but, if, but you have to get out there. If, if you constantly hold it to the best, and you never let it out, then it never improves, and it never grows. You have to... Uh, I've always said, and I've said for years, the the worse a writer is at taking criticism, the worse mm-hmm. they are as a writer. Yeah. Because they show their stuff to somebody, and somebody says, oh, well, you actually did this wrong. And they're like, oh, no, no, I didn't. You're wrong. Well, guess what? They're right, and you will never grow. You will never change. Well, you know, even when I write, just when I write emails to someone that you know for an important project or whatever, I have learned don't send that email yet. Set, set, you know, set aside for a few minutes, go back to it, and I always find something I did wrong or something I spelled wrong or whatever. So it's very important to, to either have someone else read your work or go over it again yourself. One of the things I wanted to say, though, is that we're, you know, our, some of our listening audience may not have the funds necessary to go out there and pay for a professional editor. But there is a process that you can do. You set up readers, people that you know, people that have the ability to to take a book and understand what's being said. You want readers that are not going to just pat you on the back and say, oh, that's wonderful, Mm because I have the best friend in the world. When I started writing, she told me, you this is great this is wonderful i go back and read that now and i call her up on the phone every time i do and i say nancy you're the best friend i ever had (laughs) because it was horrible i mean we're always horrible (laughs) when we start but what i once you get that that readers group going Mm -hmm. 
then after you have that, then you look at maybe an English teacher that knows how to proofread and they can look at it that way. The final steps you want to go to are the editors you pay. Well, one of the things you said that was just important just now is if you're, you're, you, if you don't have the funds necessary to go out there and hire a professional mm -hmm. editor, at least go to a writer's group like oh, what you were talking absolutely. about. Absolutely. Because you can read your work there, and somebody in that writer's group is going to excel in English. So they can definitely help you you know, with syntax and grammar. And well, not only that, in, it, it, like Henderson Writer's Group is a critiquing group, mm -hmm. and you read – what we do is they get to read for 10 minutes, and then there's five minutes of critiquing. But they also have sheets that they pass out – of what they've read, of what they've read, mm -hmm. and people are marking on those. So we don't usually go in for the uh, you're missing a comma here, you're missing a period there. We go in for the bigger stuff. You've you you've got too much passive voice. Uh, you're not using active verbs. You know things like that where it, it's going to help them have a better story. Drake, what about you? When 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 you started writing, I don't think you probably knew Joe. I'm I'm assuming. So who did your editing for you in the beginning? Well, um, it, it was really the same thing. I just I, I was always um, very desiring to get people to read my stuff mm -hmm. uh, so much to, you know, lock them in a room and just give them the papers, papers and not let them out until they have finished reading it. So you actually relied uh, on family and friends then? Well, I try to stay away from family and friends, and just like Joe said earlier, your mother is going to love what you've yeah, done, no matter true. if it's good or not. It, so I do try to stay with that. I always, I am, you know, now that I'm, I've got, you know, a, a large fan base, and I do a lot of uh, fan conventions, and, and my, I have to uh, really hold back my natural reaction because people come up and they're like, "Oh, I read this; it's so awesome." And I'm like, "You liar! Tell me what was wrong," <laughs> <laughs> because that's the only way I can grow. It's the only way I can change and and, and get better. Um, but I can't do that because they're you know actually paying me money to read my stuff. So right. you know, it's I, they're fans; they enjoy it. Right. Um, and the funny thing is, is fans take my work as serious as I take my stuff. My fans take it more serious. Well, I believe that, Denny. What about you? You know, I uh, I agree with uh, with Joe and Drake that uh, you you need to have your work evaluated. I think mm -hmm. critiqued, and I made the mistake of letting my first book, my first manuscript, uh, a very close friend and a family member, mm -hmm. and just that just happened to me. Boy, they told me how great everything was, and I actually believed them. I didn't realize mm -hmm. that they we're trying to make me feel good and that, that was a mistake so you got to have it can be a friend but it's got to be somebody that's trying to help you and that you can work with well i'm going to tell you all three a story and then you i'd like to have your feedback on this when i started writing my first book i didn't know how to go about getting anyone to look at my work so i hired what was i thought professional editors and i probably went through three and i'm going to tell you right now i spent a fortune on those editors mm -hmm. a couple thousand here a couple of grand there and I'm going to be honest with you. With my second novel, I didn't go that route. I went to a professor at UNLV mm -hmm. and paid her to edit my work for me. I can't see the difference between what this, these professionals, three of them did, as opposed to what one person did. Uh, how do you guys feel about that? Whenever anyone comes to me and says, what about an editor? I always tell them, one, you need to know what kind of editor you need. Two, you need to get references from them, and you need to see samples of their work. Mm -hmm. And if, if once you get those references, check them, because there's a lot of people out there that they know how to put a comma in, but they don't know how to edit professionally. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to look for that final, glossy edit, you need to have someone who knows the business. And I, I would like to touch a little bit on the script writing. Drake, I know you wrote a play recently. Mm -hmm. Um how, how does that play into that? Because, you know, there's what's called script doctors out there. I'm sure everyone's heard of those. And when you have a, a script that you're trying to get into the hands of a producer or whatever, they entice you to send your script to them, and you pay them four or $500 or whatever. How, what is your thought on that? Well, um, I've never used uh, a script doctor. I actually am a book doctor uh, for novels, and I've done six or seven projects now. Um, and it, it depends on what you're looking for, and it depends on the level of writing that you're at and your level of uh, ability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, my first book, they hired a, um, a really high-end content editor for, uh, Patrick Labruto. He is the, the editor for the Dune series of Brian 
Kevin Herbert and Kevin Anderson. He was Stephen King's editor. He was uh, Raymond Feist's editor. Um, Don't forget Asimov. He was, uh, he was <laughs> Isaac, Isaac Asimov's editor. Um, so he was very expensive, um, <clears throat> thousands and thousands of dollars. And he, and I'm, this is not a dig to him, he was awesome, but he added literally very, very little and told them that, you know, even though it was my first book, I didn't need that level. And that's what Joe was saying earlier. There are, there are different types of editors that have different levels of skill. Right. Some of them, like me, I am great at content editing. If you bring me a story, I can tell you where your holes are. I can tell you where you need more action or more drama. I can tell you where you need to back off, where you're meandering. I can't tell you how to put sentences together. Right, so that's where to, Joe comes in. And, this is and, what I wanted to get at. There are well, levels to editing. It's not just one editor sometimes. No. Yeah, and 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 – and also, and there's always crossover. I mean, Joe is an incredibly great at sentence structure and paragraph <laughs> structure, which is what I need. But she is also good at, um, you know, finding those missing holes and missing pieces uh, that a lot of writers need. I've just been kind of blessed with the fact that, you know, I'm pretty good at that naturally. Joe, uh, that is my one talent. Joe wanted to add something to your What comment. I was going to say was you can't edit your own work. Right. That yeah, that, you, that you I, have I think to have we all agree a on that. different yeah. pair of eyes look mm-hmm. at it. You need and someone that. with an objective opinion. Yes. So, yeah. All right, yeah. Joe. Would you like to read the second part of this quote, or which, do you have it? Which one? Well, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, the second part of her quote oh. is: "Is while the writing industry is swamped with warnings about unscrupulous individuals who want to take the hard-earned cash of the would-be author, and the truth is, many writers need a little help with their manuscripts." We, I basically, we just talked about that, about how you have to be very careful with, with the people who are out there editing your work. Because anyone can say they're an editor and put themselves on the Internet, and you, you don't know. And I think what Joe said is very important. Find some information about that person. You Make well, sure I've, they're credible. I've got a pretty cool story that, that goes along with that. Um, when I first started, uh, this was before I was published, because you should try everything that you can – to get your manuscript as polished as possible before you start submitting it mm-hmm. to industry. Yes. So before I was published, um, I wanted to polish my membership. I wanted to get as much advice and help as I could. And there are a lot of – the one, I guess, negative that I find in looking for an editor, if an editor says they're an all-inclusive editor, as we just talked about, there's, there's three mm-hmm. levels of editors. You've got content, line, and proof, and each one of them have their own skills and their own um, things that they look at, and they – Even though they cross over a little bit, they still are only good at one. You know, every editor is good at one of those three things, and then they can do the other two, but they're really good at it. So I didn't know this in the beginning, and I started off. um, A lot of editors will will edit two or three pages for free, so I took them up on that offer. I actually picked ten editors Mm -hmm. from all over the United States. I sent them the exact same three pages of my manuscript. (laughs) I then put that in. This is going to sound really geeky, but I'm a computer guy. I put that into an Excel spreadsheet and did a statistical analysis on the whole thing. And it was amazing that I had 10 editors who all said they could do the whole kit and caboodle. Right. And each one of them only found 20% of the same mistakes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I think the take on that is what we were also saying a while ago is when you're putting your, your work in the hands of someone else, their idea on how that should flow is going to be different from your idea. And one thing I did learn along the way, I hopefully I've learned, is that when you have an idea, as long as it's a great idea, don't let someone talk you out on how that should flow. Mm-hmm. They're, they're really there to guide you. and Kind of like what you said earlier, fill in the holes, the gaps, where there's not the drama that you need. Or Go ahead, Jim. You know, whenever, when I take on a project for, to do content editing for someone, uh, the first thing I tell them is what I write on the page is a suggestion of a different way you could phrase that where it's tighter and more concise, but you need to put it in your own words. Mm-hmm. I would never take an author's voice away from them. And any, uh, any editor that does isn't worth their salt. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, the other part of the quote is going into this manuscript <coughs> evaluation. She's basically talking about how important it is to get your work in order to secure an agent or a major publisher. Um, and... I do want to talk a little bit about that. We're going off the subject a tiny bit. But, you know, a lot of times an agent or a publisher will say, send me a synopsis. How important do you think that is for either all three of you that are on the panel? I think it's very important. 
So your synopsis can be just as important as the novel itself because that's how you're going to get the attention well, of... Well, your, your synopsis tells them at the beginning, this is what my title is, these are who my characters are, this is how many words, this is what genre it is. And then you go through and tell them what stumbling blocks hit the characters, what they have to go, you know, get over, what hurdles they have to get over. Mm -hmm. And then it tells them how it ends. They can't sell that book unless they know all those things. Mm -hmm. So a, a synopsis is extremely important. Yeah, yeah and yeah. the other side of that is, now you're, you're assuming that the agent has the synopsis because you know, we kind of skipped the query letter and we can go back to it if you want to. But the, the other thing about a synopsis and the reason why it's so important is um, it is a way for the, um, for the uh, agent or publisher to know that you can actually tell a story. If you mm -hmm. if you can't tell your entire story in a summary where you're actually it's still engaging mm -hmm. and it still has some depth to it in eight pages, then they're probably not going to want to spend money. You know, all the hundreds exactly. of thousands of dollars that it takes to get a, a book to market uh, on a you know 150 thousand word book. Exactly. So those eight pages are very important. And and you brought up the point about the query letter. That's so important too. If someone's trying to seek um, a major publishing house, and actually even an agent. Uh, the query letter is so important. And Danny, what about you? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's a chance, uh, maybe the only chance you're going to get to kind of show these people, be it an agent or a publisher, that what you've got. And, uh, and the other thing is I, I've seen people make, I think, serious mistakes. They don't do any research, and they will just start to go and starting with the A and the alphabet and start sending stuff out. And they don't research and find out maybe this publisher or agent doesn't handle their genre. Right. I and think uh, that's the key to, to going after an agent or, or a publisher is that you have to make sure that if you're writing science fiction, that's what they handle. Exactly. You know, because they, yeah. they all specialize pretty much in, in certain – yes, go ahead. Um, yeah. Trent. Well, I was just going to say I'm, I'm, I'm friends with a, a fairly big New York uh, agent. And the one thing he said we – were, we were out to dinner when it was years ago when I first met him. And he actually made a comment to me that I just thought was absolutely dumb. He said, if – the query letter doesn't have my name on it, I reject it without even reading the first word. And right, I, I, instead of dear uh, sir or to whom it may, a con may concern. Right. And right. originally I was like, that's insane. Why would you? I mean, that could be the next, um, you know, New York Times bestselling book. And he said, well, you know, there are 50 different genres and I handle five of them. And if, if somebody didn't do the research to know that they're sending it to me, <laughs> more than likely it's one of those that I don't even represent anyway. <laughs> So I don't want to waste my time going down that path. So a lot of rejections that you'll get are just because you didn't even do any research at all. But you know what's interesting about what you just said? I found that when I would send out to, to whom it may concern, and I'm guilty of that, you're right. I rarely ever got a response. But when I did address it to a particular agent or publisher, I usually, even though they sent out a form letter, I would always have notes at the bottom. They would send me some kind of notes. So that told you that they really did look at it. So I think you're exactly right. It's important to target that person. Yes, Joe? One thing people don't realize about a query letter, though, is you're not sitting there just saying, hi, I've got a book I want you to read. This is your first stab at marketing that yeah. book. Yeah. And if you don't market it well to the agent or publisher, they're going to think you're not going to be able to market it to the public. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's also your, it, it is your resume. It, it, it mm -hmm. amazes me uh, the amount of bad query letters that I get handed uh, at all the conventions that I do and writers' mm -hmm. conferences. And I sit there and go, would you apply for a job with the second word of your resume being misspelled? I think that would probably be the first thing to just chuck that to the side. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and that's, that's, the, that's the thing is they just they're, – they're like, okay, well, this is a query letter that I'm, I'm trying to market my piece. And it is. It, 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 everything Joe said was absolutely true. It is your first mm -hmm. person that you are literally trying to sell your book to. It's your first piece of marketing. But it's also your resume. It is the one thing that is going to separate you as a professional or as an amateur. So I guess it would be fair to say that once you have your work completed and you have it edited, you really need to focus on the query letter and the synopsis. And you really need to have someone edit those as well mm -hmm. if you're yes. not that great at it. Because, like you said, that is your calling card. So it doesn't matter I how great your story is or your book is or your script – if you can't get someone to read it, you, you're just wasting your time anyway. Yes, and I would actually go a step further than that because you, you made the comment uh, of even if you're, not, you know, if you're not good at editing a query letter or editing yourself to go ahead. I think it's important to get it edited 
I mean, I would pay someone to edit a query letter. I mean, that's <laughs> it, it's that important. Yeah. They could probably sell your work whether this, the book's good or not. <laughs> It'll at least get you read. I mean, yeah, the, yeah, that's the true. Book, you're, you're never going to sell a book that is terrible. I mean, if the book is absolutely you know just up right, yeah. trash, it's not going to sell. But if your query letter is fantastic, you'll at least get an a- agent to say, yeah, go ahead and send me that. That's, that sounds interesting because your marketing was – you know, professional and upfront. Um, now, if they get it in and it's you know not good, then they'll send you a, that thank you letter that says you're awesome. That, but you're just not exactly what they're looking for at this time. I see Joe has something to add to that. <laughs> no, I was just laughing because I've gotten some of those submissions since, <laughs> since we started Ink and Quill. Uh, one lady sent me her her first five chapters in the body of the email, mm-hmm. and each chapter was like two paragraphs long. Oh, wow. And I sent her back, and I said, first thing you need to do is join a writer's group. Second thing, take a writing class. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's just no way to get around it. If if they're not going to put themselves into the work, they're not going to get a product back. That and everything you buy. just mentioned is not something that's going to cost anyone anything. No. You know, maybe a yearly membership of, what, like 40 50 bucks, But beyond that, yeah. you know, and it's well worth it if you can get people to critique what you're doing. Well, yeah. I've had people that come into my, my writing classes that I teach, because I teach beginning and intermediate and advanced writing mm-hmm. for the city of Henderson at two different recreation centers. And everybody that comes in says, I've taken creative writing classes, but I've never learned any of this because I'm teaching them writer technique, not how to write. Right, right. Well, the last part of Donna L. Cuisenberry's quote is, not every writer is a copy editor, desktop publisher, or word processing wizard. Every author may have a little exposure to each of these. However, you need a fine-tooth proofreader and a classic editor and also recognize the impact, markability, plot, and the premise that is essential in order to gain an agent or publisher. Mm -hmm. So this is all what we were just talking about. This is very important. for people to understand, you can have your work done, but if you don't have someone read it, and the only way you're going to get them to read it is with a query letter and then a synopsis, well, then too, you're in, out of luck. In today's market, you have to have that print ready. They are not going to waste the time with you to edit you and nurture you along like they used to. Now you have to be ready to go when they come in because it just costs them too much to to do the other stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people, people hate to hear me say this, but I say it at every class that I do. This is an industry that has nothing to do with telling compelling stories or being witty or entertaining or any of that stuff. This is an industry about making money. Publishers invest money in authors' projects. And, and the word invest is very, very crucial. In other words, they want – not only do they want their money back, but they want profit also in addition to the money back. So you do have to think about that. You have to approach it. I mean, if you want to write a book for yourself and for your friends and your family, that's awesome. And I don't – I mean, that's, again, ninth book that I ever wrote is what got published for the first time because I never really thought about doing it professionally until the last, you know, eight, nine years. Mm-hmm. But – but once you make that leap, once you go, I'm going to write professionally, you really need to, and it was the same thing um, that was said earlier, um, that somebody, and I don't remember if, if it was Joey or, but somebody made a mistake and didn't learn the industry before they started. That was me. Trying. <laughs> okay. Um, I remember hard knocks. It somebody. But it was, you know, that's the thing. If, if, if you're going to go down this path, you have to understand that this is an industry and the only way to continue to do it, I mean, I'm a full-time writer. I, this is my only job. It's how I, I mean, my bills don't stop just because, you know, the electric company goes, doesn't go, oh, you're a writer. We're not going to charge you anything. This right, exactly. You're awesome. Yeah, you still have to pay I the bills. Still get yeah. a, I still get an electric bill. Mm. Uh, and they kind of expect to get paid. Yeah. Um, so, and that's the thing that I think a lot of new writers miss. They go, oh, I've got this great idea, and I'm so wonderful, and, and I'm such a witty person. And, of course, the industry is going to buy it because it's just fantastic. And they don't think about marketing, and they don't think about you know what it takes to actually get a person to buy the book. But and I've said what's important too is to, to for not just the people who are trying to get published by a major publisher. We have people out there who self publish, and and in the self publishing industry today, you can make a very good living at it. But everything we talked about still applies. I mean, maybe Absolutely. you're not writing query letters or whatever, but you still have to make sure your editing is you know top notch. 
Because you, you, that first person who buys it, if it isn't good, is going to give it a negative review. Absolutely. And then nobody else is going to buy it. So mm-hmm. there's still – So the rules yeah, still apply. Have to do the whole thing. Yeah. But Joe? You, you also uh, – I lost my train of thought here for a minute, but – you also have to have a marketing plan if you're going to self-publish. The the people that I help self-publish, the first thing I ask them is, what are you going to do to market? Because if they don't have a marketing plan, those books are going to sit in their garage. And then they get mad at me, and I don't want anybody mad at well, me. Well, and, and <laughs> to take it a step further, I think – I think this is the mistake a lot of authors make. They think that if they go to someone else to have it published or someone helps them self-publish, they think that's all they have to do. That's mm-hmm. just the beginning. You oh, have yeah. to sell yourself every day, and you can't rely on an agent or a manager or anyone else to do it. You have to get out there and physically make that effort yourself. You know, you and have to put yourself not, out there in the public. It is not just self-publishing either. I mean, it is uh, – I'm on the mm-hmm. road – over 100 days this year. My first uh, my first out of t- town trip was this last weekend. I just got back in last night at like three o'clock in the morning, so I'm a little tired. But um, well, if you don't if le- you don't go and market yourself, nobody else will. Let me ask you this, Drake. When you have a book coming out and you have someone you know that has published you, I'm sure that you make those contacts yourself. A lot of them. Well, I mean, I do have a business manager, and she does a lot for me, and she does a lot of calls. Uh, and then I have an assistant that uh, also fields some of it. I mean, he he does a lot of – I use him for my – because I do travel a lot, and there's a lot of product to take, and there's a lot of just stuff that has to get done. But so, you do lectures as well, so that's you know. – But I do a lot of lectures. Mm-hmm. I speak at a lot of writers' conferences and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I, I – But I you still put yourself people. out there, I'm sure. Absolutely. I mean, I have to. I mean, there's no way – even though I have other people doing things for me now, um, and that's taken years to get to that level, but uh, it's still every author. I mean, I, I love to quote, uh, and, I, and I may be wrong on this. This is where I read somewhere. But uh, when Dan Brown's last book came out, uh, I read that he spent about $700,000 of his own money wow. marketing himself, in addition to the one point five or you know, who knows, I'm, I'm making a number up here, but right. whatever the, the publisher spent on marketing that book. Um, it, it is something. I mean, I spend my own money every year in addition to what the publisher spends on marketing me, and, and there are conventions and, and events that they pay for, but I, a lot of them I pay for. I think Joe has a comment to make on that. You know, we, I have a friend who wrote a book. Uh, he was actually commissioned to write a book for Career Press, okay. and he sent in his first uh, uh, his first proposal, and they rejected it. He said, well, what can I do to fix it? And they said, well, we were kind of going in this direction. So he did a second proposal and sent it to them. And they said, oh, yeah, we really like the book uh, or the way it's going to be. So he wrote the book. They published it. He went out and did all kinds of marketing until he got onto the bestseller list for his genre. Mm -hmm. Then Career Press comes back and says, oh, and by the way, we have a publicist for you. <laughs> you know? So he still had to do it. And I don't know about Denny, but I, you know, I don't know what Huntington wants, but I know there are publishers that say, write me a book on what you're going to do for marketing, you know, and they right. expect as exactly. much. How about your experience with that, Denny? Uh, yeah, if, if you're not willing to market, and, and I've, I've run into some people who are just plain shy. They, they get terrified if they think they got to speak in front of any kind of a right. group or anything. Right. And uh, no matter how good their book is, it's going to be very difficult if they can't deal with the public or can't market yeah. themselves or sell themselves. And, um, it, and marketing, I think, is, you know, is as important, really, as the, as the book itself. Well, so I think it's important what Drake said earlier, that if you're writing for yourself or you're writing for your family, that's, that's well and that's great. And that's, you, you know, do that. But if you're thinking about taking that to the next mm-hmm. level, then you better be prepared because writing it was the easy part, really. Yeah. You know, yeah. the next and, and what I was going to say earlier was, uh, and this is another thing that kind of breaks in people's hearts, uh, as hard as it is to get published, uh, and it is, it's incredibly hard. I've, I've made the comment that you have about as much chance of being bitten by a shark while being struck <laughs> by a lightning, while getting a phone yeah, yeah, yeah. call that you won the lottery, <laughs> as getting published. Exactly. But it is actually way harder, ten <laughs> times harder to sell your first book, and then just as hard to sell the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth, five thousandth and the ten thousandth, um, until you get to that point where you're, you know, selling a hundred, hundred fifty thousand uh, copies, and then you have your fan base is marketing you without you actually having to do it. Um, you know, those multi-million copy selling authors. That's how they got there. Is you know a lot of money and a lot of time, and then a lot of fans. Um, so. It is. It's very, 
very difficult, and you have to market yourself. I don't care if you're self-published or not. Self-publishing mm -hmm. is even harder because you don't have that uh, arm. You don't have right. That, uh, it's up to you. Know, you you ha well, mm -hmm. there there is a one of the things that's so nice about having a publisher is a seal of um, authentication, and, it, and it's not that it's it's one is real and one is not, and that's not what I'm saying. When somebody goes, oh, you were published by a publisher, even if it's a small publisher or a medium publisher or a large publisher, somebody else read your stuff and was willing to put money into it. Right. When you self-publish, you lose that, and it's not that it's bad. But actually, you're putting your money into it at that you point. You put your money, yeah. and so you've made the decision to do it, but right. nobody else has made the decision right. with their money. And I would so, think that as a self-publisher, you should be more aware, if you're putting your own money into it, how important it is to get out there and – Push your well, work. Get the editors. Unfortunately, this is a um, this like every other industry that's entertainment is a very um, enticing industry. I mean, there's a reason why there are millions and millions and millions of waiters out there who will one day hope to become, mm -hmm. you know, a movie star. You and know, they'll, they'll spend all that time with it. It's I have to read this quote because it's exactly what you're saying, and then we'll comment on it. A poll of two, uh, a poll of 2,700 U.S. internet users representing 100 million people based on their criteria. Use the Internet indicates that they are about there are about 8 million unpublished novels, 17 million unpublished how-to books by the Internet using public alone, which means these are people who have an idea for a book or a concept for a book but haven't published it yet. So think about that, 17 million unpublished how-to books. I know. I have a few myself. And, and most of the major <laughs> houses are looking for the infamous or the famous. Right. Yes. Can can I go back to marketing for just a second? Absolutely. I, just, sure. I, I talked to a, a publisher's uh, marketing person one day, and, and we were, she was quite candid with me. And she told me that they had published uh, an author, and he had submitted now a second manuscript. Mm -hmm. And she says, we're going to turn this down. We're, we're not going to accept the second manuscript. And I says, why? I said, and she said, well, she said, the writing was okay. She said, but based on the first one, she said, he thought once we published that book and it got in print, his work was done. She said, his work should have just been beginning. Yeah. And uh -huh. she says, we're not going to invest in this guy again. He's proven to us that he's not a marketer. And he has to be a marketer oh, wow. if we're going to publish that yeah, book. Yeah, that's very good advice. Um, another fun fact <coughs> is 64% of book buyers say a book Books being on a bestseller list is not important to them, and I agree with that. I don't know if you've ever. I've done a lot of you know. I've set in. I've done a few book signings. I've set in for other authors who've done book signings, and I I look around the store when I'm sitting there before an event and even after sometimes, and I look at people go over and pick up a book and and and, and what they do, and they always look at that cover. They always look at that title, and then they flip it and read the back. So I believe – I don't even think they pay attention to whether it's a bestseller or not. They're looking for something specifically, and then they want to see how it's going to read based on that back, that little synopsis on the back. Publishers Weekly did a, a survey a few years ago where they put people into bookstores and, wa and had them watch how people bought books. Mm -hmm. And first they would look at the spine, then they would look at the back blurb, and then they would open it up to the first page. And then if they liked it, they would buy it. If not, they'd put it back. It was an average of eight seconds. Right, I, I I agree with that too. Drake, what's your your opinion on that? Oh, I mean, you know, again, I I travel a lot. I do I do about twenty to thirty major conventions, and then you know, a half a dozen small conventions a year. And I've been blessed. The publisher that I'm with uh, spends money for the best fantasy artists in the industry. I I put my covers against any covers out there from any of the bigger houses, and I'm with a smaller house. Um, and I do feel sorry for them. When I'm at a convention, I'm usually against self-publishers or other small published authors. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, last year, I, I make this joke, last year at, at Gen Con, which is a, a fantasy convention, about 40,000 people, I was sitting next to a guy who's a friend of mine. I've known him for years, and he's basically self-published. And I sold 280 books in two days, and he sold six. Uh, which I thought was a shame. But uh, sometimes that has to deal with the person themselves mm -hmm. and the way you're marketing yourself as well. Because I, I actually heard that story, and I heard that you're a go-getter, that you actually get people involved I, in what you're doing, you bring them to your lectures. I mean, and, th and, and that's what part of goes back to what Denny was saying well, about marketing yourself is so important. Yes, I mean, I'm tenacious. I mean, I sold, a, I sold one of my books to the guy when I checked in my Toyota to get the oil changed. I mean, I will... See, I will so, you so you're going to sell, you're going to outsell more people than, you know, <laughs> anyway, just because of... of the, the very but no, but the, 
But the book cover is uh, yeah, oh, it's I, essential. It's, that is what's the sight of that book is what's going to bring people over to read it or look at absolutely. it. Absolutely, and yeah. and that's you know we have this huge booth display which is expensive. You know the publisher spent for, you know for most of it, but I've added some to it. But you know you spend five thousand dollars on a booth display. Most authors aren't going to spend that kind of cash for you know a nice, massive, impressive booth display. But it is the reason why you know. My booth has got lines of people, even if they've never, I mean, every convention, and I've been doing this for, you know, professionally for almost six years now, and every single convention I do, more than half the people that come up to me go, wow, this looks great. I've never heard of you. I'm like, well, you know, I've only won awards, and I'm in all the bookstores, and it's in foreign <laughs> languages, and, you know, it's, I can understand why. No, but it's, there's just so much competition. There's so many books yeah, I think- out there. Yeah, Joe wanted to add to that. The very first book signing that I did with my co-author, we we sold 26 books in two hours. The lady that was there at the opposite table sat there and knitted for two hours and sold no books. Right. I mean, if you're, if you're yeah. not it's, – it's the same thing. I've been in the hotel industry most of my life, and it's the same thing that when, when you have a guest – I worked front desk at one hotel in Atlanta at one time, and they, they, they were very – very much we had to look at the guests. When they walked up to that counter, you had to be looking at that guest. You don't look down mm-hmm. and pretend like you're reading something. You look the guest in the eye. And it's the same way when we're doing our books. If you're at a book signing, you're not going to be sitting there with your head down writing something. You should be looking out into the audience and seeing who's going to be coming at you. And I, I do that anyway. I've yeah. done that in the past. Absolutely. Uh, basically, every single person and, – and the books are impressive. We have gigantic posters. But everyone – and you could tell. I mean I was at the, the Tucson Festival Books this weekend – and you can tell when somebody's looking at the art because it's just so impressive, but they're not a fantasy fan. I mean, you know, at a book festival, you have every reader type from every genre, but I still hark them over. I, you know, we have our pamphlets, and we go, you know, would you like some information on the series? And they're like, no, I'm just looking at the picture. And that's fine, but you've got to get out there, and you've got to take that risk of harking them. You've got to, because... Maybe they are a fantasy fan that they just don't look like it. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many fantasy books I've sold to 60-year-old grandmothers that I never thought I would have. And if I hadn't have harked them over, I would never have known that, oh, yeah, I love reading fantasy. This is awesome stuff. I just It's like, really? Wow. Um, you're not my target market, but here's a book. Well, I'm uh, gonna, one of the things I want to share with, with the listeners is uh, as well, the Internet is a great resource for anything you want to do when mm-hmm. it comes to writing. But we have um, we have 12 great um, sites for reluctant readers, um, and we're going to mention a few of those on the air so that you can go to the Internet and check these out. This is encouragement not just for the up-and-coming author, but for children as well, where they can go on and create their own children's stories. Uh, there's different places you can go and learn how to write newspaper articles. Joe, would you like to read the first one? Um, the first one is Story Jumper. Great, uh, great for children's stories. Story Jumper allows you to create online books using a plethora of characters, scenes, and props. Teachers can, for free, create a class to register students. So they each have their own account. Wow, that's nice. That's neat. Yeah, it is cool. As on this, as on this. As of this writing. Oh, as of this writing. (laughs) I'm (laughs) well. There does seem to be a limit as to how many students, uh, student accounts you can create. Can I make a comment here? Absolutely. Henderson Writers Group every year does a student writer writing contest. Mm-hmm. They can uh, p- people that are interested in it from middle school to college can look this up on hendersonwritersgroup.com. We give away $300 for first place. Mm-hmm. We give away uh, $200 for second place. The first place winners can can actually win a full ride to the conference that we throw every year. 3 days worth of intensive writing classes and and authors and publishers that you can pitch your books to i mean and the and the second place winners win and these for like high school students high school and we don't give it to middle school because we found that they they weren't coming anyway Mm -hmm. but the high school and college kids they come every year and we have special randall platt is going to be there this year to do our students saturday well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just briefly mention a few because, you know, we're going to be out of time here in a few minutes. But there's also what's called Printing Press. Just go to printingpress.com, and that's for newspaper articles, brochures, booklets, and flyers. There's also Kerpoof, which is kind of neat. That's one for creating stories and comic characters online. Um, and that's also great for teachers because they, they can actually um, register their students online as well. Then there's um, Story Starters. 
that's another one. And then, then My Story Maker. And then the sixth one is Writing with Writers. Seventh is Zoo Burst. And eighth is Bit Strips. I don't know if any of you have heard of those or not, but I actually checked them out, and they're really cool, especially for kids, because you can start a sentence. It actually helps you do the design, and it actually starts you off with the story. If you have an opening line, it will show you what direction to go in with that story. And then at the same time, you can create your characters, and it will help you design those characters for you online, a lot of those. Um, but one that I find great for myself when I'm writing you know, um, scripts, I, I use Final Draft. And you were saying, Denny, you use? Celtics. Celtics, okay. Um, and then there's also Fake Brains for those, of the, those who are into article writing. Um, or for businesses, and then MSGL, which is uh, the media services group for um, software for book publishing and magazines. Um, we're running out of time here, so I would like to thank the guests who've been here tonight. Uh, first, I'd like to say that on next week's show, the topic is going to be preparing uh, your work for print. And in addition to always uh, talking about the creative process and the importance of formatting your work, we'll be talking about how to choose a title, the importance of the book cover's design, which we hit a little bit on tonight. And, Denny, you can attest that's very important. <laughs> um, and then obtaining an international, stand, uh, international standard book numbering or an ISBN. This is basically for self-publishers. And why it is important if you're going to self-publish you know, to have like an ISBN or a standard address number, which is an SAN. They're a little technical, and we're going to try and make it easy for you to understand this. But if you're going to self-publish, these are tools you're going to need. And it wouldn't hurt to know, even if you're a published author, what these are for because they are on your book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're in everyone's book that gets published. And my guests next week um, are going to be Judy McFadden. And then also um, uh, we have uh, a special guest, author, director, producer, Don Lewis Barnhart. He will be on the show next week as well. You may know him from Mork, or Mindy, Mork and Mindy or from uh, – there's another one. Oh, well, we'll, we'll go into that next <laughs> week. <laughs> Forgot. Um, I'd like to thank my guest, Joe Wilkins, and Maxwell and is at Alexander Drake, and then Denny Griffin. If you need links to their sites, I have them on Aspects of Writing. Joe's going to give me a few. She doesn't give me very many. Um, Aspects of Writing is broadcast live every Monday here on KLAV. Um, future air dates and lineups can also be found at um, www.aspectsofwriting.com. Or you can go to the klav1230am.com website um, for links. Um, if you go to the Aspects of Writing website, please sign our guest book while visiting Aspects of Writing. And you can post questions or comments about the show there. Remember, if you can dream it, you can write it. Thank you for listening to Aspects of Writing. This is James Kelly. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Aspects of Writing here on KLAV every other Monday at 9 p.m. Your host, James Kelly, will bring you an informative look at every aspect of the writing industry. Guests on the show will share their experience and what inspired them to write. Together, we will explore every aspect of writing, including how to create, format, and sell your work. So join us every other Monday for Aspects of Writing right here on KLAV. My name is Jeffrey Burke and I'm the host of the Staying Healthy Show here on KLAV. The Staying Healthy Show is now on KLAV 10 times per week. 10 times for you to hear the best guest in the industry and learn about the best nutritional products available for your good health. You can hear my show weekday mornings at 8 and a new show again at 5. Both shows are drive time for your listening pleasure. The show is sponsored by Stay Healthy Health Food Store, located at 840 South Rancho Drive in the Rancho Town & Country Center on the northwest corner of Charleston and Rancho. The hours of the store are Monday through Friday from 9 to 7 p.m., Saturdays 9 to 6, and closed on Sundays. Wayne Rudolph built his store with three principles in mind. Great products and selection, a knowledgeable staff, and memorable service every time you visit his store. Please tune into the Staying Healthy Show 10 times per week here on KLAV. I'm looking forward to chatting with all of you and helping you get healthy, be healthy, and stay healthy.